Welcome to God's Planning, contemplative preachers, contemporary age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Welcome to God's Planning. We are here joining you from Washington, D.C. in Providence. I'm Father Gregory Pine, joined here by Father Jacob Bertrand and Father Patrick Mary Briscoe. And uh, this is our now regularly recurring Sunday Lexio in anticipation of the first Sunday of Easter, which is to say Easter. <laughs> uh, so we're delighted to be with you uh, virtually in as much as anyone is with anyone at this juncture in our lives. Um, just to share some meditation, some thoughts, uh, some contemplation on the readings of this Easter Sunday. So it's a, a, a kind of an Easter tradition, I guess. I think it's a tradition. The Rhesus Piscalis, uh, that, that during this period of Easter, we should uh, laugh, we should enjoy ourselves. Certainly, things still remain sad, disastrous, devastating, and bad. Um, but we can't sustain sorrow for that long because our human frames are weak and we just can't bear the burden. So we're going to try to be as lighthearted as we can without being flippant because we're praying for you. We're, yeah, we're, we're hoping that that things kind of turn a corner. We're, we're supposed to be in like peak week at certain places. I have no idea what that means because it still means a lot of people pass away for which we offer our prayers and suffrages. But we want to, yeah, we want to try our best. So with that in mind, we're going to turn now to the opening collect for Easter Sunday Mass, and Father Patrick is going to lead us in that. Let us pray. O oh God, who on this day, through your only begotten Son, have conquered death and unlocked for us the path to eternity, grant, we pray, that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may, through the renewal brought by your Spirit, rise up in the light of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. During this Easter season, as you are accustomed to hear, we um, will read often from the Acts of the Apostles, which testifies to the life of the early church. And, you know, in the first couple of chapters, we hear about uh, the ascension, the Lord's early instructions to the apostles, and then the shaping of the Christian community. But it's also a beautiful extended discourse on the effects of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit in Christian life. And so Father Patrick is going to read our first reading. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to speak and said, You know what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of living and dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So on Easter Sunday morning, the, the first thing that we hear as from, from the scriptures is, is a sort of um, recitation of all that's happened uh, in, in our Lord's life, but particularly in what has happened in the last week through Holy Week and, and through the Triduum. And uh, it's, it's sort of a creed in, in a way that, that, Peter, that Peter professes. It summarizes um, our Lord's mission salvation history, his, his works while here on earth during his active ministry, his death, his resurrection, and after his resurrection, even, even though it's just Easter Sunday, we, we kind of get a, a kind of bird's eye view of, or a sample of what's to come that our Lord will eat and drink and present his, himself and his resurrected body to the, disciple, to the disciples and to those who believe. And it, it's kind of, I remember, I remember when I was, I don't know, a teenager or something, whatever, I was in in church and one of the readings had, I was there with my family and one of the readings kept repeating 
uh, the the kind of same things over and over. I believe, if I remember correctly, it was from the old <clears throat> the Old Testament passage um, when when our Lord was begged to save save the city if there were but 50, 50 righteous people, if there were but forty, if there were but thirty. You know, this sort of repetition and. Um, I think it was my brother, I'll say it was my brother, after Mass, sort of, we complained together about, like, we got it, like, the first couple times, and it keeps going, and it keeps going. And here on Easter Sunday, when I was reading or listening to the words of, of Peter, I kind of had the same feeling that it's Easter Sunday. We know, like, we know that Christ is risen. We know that he died. We just heard this yesterday. And yet, the church provides us with this, this reading, the first thing on Easter Sunday morning, to call us again to, to recollect and to remember, to think about, meditate upon the mystery. And it repeats it for us, not because, well, sometimes because we're kind of thick and don't get it right away and, and need to be told again and again and again. Uh, but more importantly, I think because, because it is the central reality of our faith, Christ died, he rose, and he is victorious, and his death is, is salvific. It redeems us. So the church, God, through the church and through the scriptures, through the apostles, through Peter, tells us over and over and over again. Because that's simply how much he loves us. And that should be the center and the, and the focal point of, of our Christian life, of our, of our life in, in general. To hear this beautiful mystery, this beautiful reality preached again and again and again. I think, um, so I've noticed this in the Gospel of Luke, but there's this strong scriptural theme of recollection, or we could call it anamnesis, a kind of recalling of the mysteries of the faith as a way by which to experience them more profoundly. And um, <clears throat> so when you read the Synoptic Gospels, which is to say Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll notice that there are passion predictions. So when you get to the middle of the Gospel, the Lord Jesus looks ahead to what lies in store, and uh, he says, you know, the Son of Man will be handed over. Uh, he will, you know, suffer and die and rise from the dead. That in more words. Uh, and certainly in the Gospel of Matthew, there are three of them. In the Gospel of Mark, there are three of them. And they're very much, like, placed structurally in the Gospel of Mark. So when you get to the Gospel of Luke, you're kind of on the lookout for it. And you're trying to identify where the three passion predictions will crop up since those, those Gospels have so very much in common. But you don't really see it in the same contours. What is striking, though, is that after the Lord rises from the dead, that those quote-unquote passion predictions are repeated, which, again, seems silly because the passion has already taken place. So what is the need for the announcement of something former? Uh, but it kind of hammers home this point, which is big in Luke, that we need to recall what has gone before, and we need to revisit it in order to cultivate like the sacred memory, which makes us good covenant partners with the Lord. So God does not forget us. Um, and this comes up a lot in the Old Testament, like uh, the story of Noah has this kind of structure where it's things that happen in the beginning recur at the end, but the central hinge point of the story is that God remembered Noah, which isn't to say that God forgot Noah, but it is to say that God, who is a covenant God, recalls his people. He is recollected in the presence of his people. He is not forgetful of his people. And as a result of which, he honors his promises to his people, whereas Israel does forget. Israel is unrelected, unrecollected, and as a result of which, she wanders or wins her way, this and that. So Luke has this sensibility that we need not only to foretell what will come so that we can be prepared for it, but also that we need to speak of what has come before in order better to appreciate it in light of the mystery itself. So there are two passion predictions in Luke, but then there are two afterwards, one from the angel and then one from Christ himself in the course of um, the road to Emmaus, you know, where this kind of sacred memory is being cultivated in the people of God. And so here in the preaching of Acts, I mean, and in all Christian preaching effectively, we're just pointing back to what has gone before in order to cultivate in the people of God, the memory of those mighty deeds, because to the extent that we recall, we are saved but to the extent that we forget, we are not. So it's very, yeah, just a very beautiful scriptural thing there. Yeah, I'd just like to extend that a little bit more and um, comment that this Easter is perhaps um, more powerful because of the kind of nostalgia that will that will dawn upon us, right? Um, this happened to me. I was celebrating the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Thursday night for three Dominican sisters in an entirely empty St. Pius Parish Church. It was it was extraordinary. It was it was you know it was totally the upside down, right? Um, it, it was just entering. It was just entering bizarre land. Because for you know for, for me in this in the story of my own priesthood the thing that the thing that moved me most deeply as a child was always Holy Week always you know and um, 
uh, from a young age, I was singing at church and, and uh, as an altar server, very involved in all of those liturgies. And so, so then to all of a sudden be celebrating the Mass of the Lord's Supper without any of that. Uh, it was, it, 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 yeah, it, it, it just, it really struck me, right? And I think we're, we're all going through that, um, recognizing that this Easter is not like other Easter's, that this Holy Week is not like other Holy Weeks, but it allows us to remember all the good things that have come. And like, that's the power that nostalgia has, which is to, um, which is to um, not just sentimentalize, but to, um, to inflame and, and really nourish deeply our faith. All right, with that, we're going to turn to our second reading. Uh, if you're following along in your missile, you'll notice that there are two options. We're going to take ours from the first of two. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, if then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life, appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, this particular passage is wild because it sounds almost Gnostic. Uh, the language that surrounds it is very like mystical and ethereal. Like what does it mean to be hidden with Christ in God? What does it mean to say that our life appears with him? Uh, what does it mean to be seated with him at the right hand of God? A lot of these descriptions... Uh, while evocative, for us are kind of ill-defined. <clears throat> but I think that the kind of linchpin here is the fact of our being part of Christ's body and so sharing with him in his resurrection. So elsewhere in his letters in 1 Corinthians, uh, St. Paul talks about uh, the kind of communion of the resurrection. And he makes this argument that um, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then we are not raised from the dead. So we have to hold to the historicity and veracity of his resurrection in order to truly hope for the resurrection of the dead at the second coming at the end of the age. Uh, so it's not just, um, yeah, it's not just a logical connection. It's a real connection. Uh, if he has not gone before us into heaven, then we have no hopes of following him after. So this means that um, like kind of our association with him, our communion with him has very like definitive effects in uh, in terms of Christian worship. So like, this is, this is an argument to live a moral life, but it's not saying like, do the good things and don't do the bad things because the bad things are bad and the good things are good. You know, he's not just like appealing to willpower. He's saying that like our life is bound up with Christ and Christ is raised. And as a result of which our life has already begun to enter the sanctuary. You'll hear people sometimes speak about the present time as the already, but not yet. So the eschatological time, the end times have already begun in Christ. And yet they have not yet been consummated in each one of us Christian believers who are to partake with him of that glory. So if we're raised with Christ, which he's saying you are, I've argued that elsewhere. We know that to be the case and seek what is above, which is to say, like, don't get kind of lost in the loveliness of earthly things, all of which are so seductive and good. But is to say, train your minds and hearts on the God who has gone before you into the sanctuary so that you might rise with him in worship of the one true God of the heavenly father. And so have your like, you know, kind of have your share in the glory that lies beyond. And so in light of that, you know, think of what is above, not of what is on earth. For you have died, that is to say, in your baptism, you have been buried with Christ. And so your life is hidden with him. You have been entombed is the image that St. Paul uses to describe those baptismal waters. And then that hiddenness is the necessary precondition to our rising with him. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies it bears much fruit. And that is the sense in which we appear, you know, like it's like a kind of germination that that seed breaks forth organically into a resurrected life, which is something for which we can truly hope. Do we give points on the podcast? Like in whose line is it anyways? Can I award yeah. you points for that? Yeah. No, that was only excellent. if I get a thousand, a thousand points for having quoted my favorite verse of scripture, uh, which is the verse from John that you just mentioned. Big. It's well, also the epigraph. Points. It's also the epigraph in Brothers Karamazov. Hey, cheers. Out of, out of boy that. Dostoevsky. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as you were talking, I decided I needed to change completely what I was going to say about this reading. Um, the we had this morning at the Office of Readings one of the one of the most evocative readings in the whole church year because we're recording this before Easter Sunday, right? So this morning was Holy Saturday. Um, 
the I'm um, just lost in liturgical time. Look at Father Jacob Virgin's <laughs> face right now. It's like <laughs> Way. He's going to kill me. This is great. I'm just going to keep going with it. Anyway, the Office of Readings on Holy Saturday has one of the most evocative readings of the whole liturgical year, and it begins with, it begins with that line, something strange is happening. But towards the end of it, there's this beautiful comparison between Christ um, as the new Adam and the, the old Adam who, um, the old Adam who caused our sins, right? Christ is the new Adam who allows us to be reborn. Um, and the old Adam is the one who causes our sins. But the reading says from this ancient homily, I slept on the cross and a sword pierced my side for you who slept in paradise and brought forth Eve from your side. My side has healed the pain in yours. My sleep will rouse you from your sleep in hell. The sword that pierced me has sheathed the sword that was turned against you. I love this line, my side has healed your side. Christ um, in all of his glory has healed all of our brokenness. Um, and this is what it means to be raised with him. It, it means to be healed, to have the, the places of our lives that are incomplete and are wounded, um, to have them put back. That being raised with Christ is, uh, is, not, uh, is, is not some kind of random um, self-aggrandization but it's um but it's a it's a kind of compliment in the sense of a filling out of, of the wholeness of who we who we who we were made to be um and and a, a putting back of, of what we were for if we're still awarding points father patrick's going to come out on zero because that was a beautiful reflection but you know he also gave away what day we're recording and since we can say we record it on any day and talk about any reading to, to meditate on <laughs> Game changer. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, one of the, one of the one of the things that this passage from Saint Paul reminded me of is is that the the idea that the resurrection alters changes our worldview entirely. And I think Paul's Paul's call here to to think of what what is above rather than being trapped and um, entertained by those things that are below reminds me a lot of John the Baptist's line. Um, that he must increase and I must decrease, that this death to self is not a death of a sort of like self-mutilation or a, a kind of um, self-loathing or self-hatred, but really it, it's a transfer of, the, of, of, um, of one's life into Christ so that one may be transformed by grace um, and elevated in, in his life. And um, I think I think what's what's really important, to, at least in my mind, with respect to to that line from John the Baptist, is when when you hear that John the Baptist speak, or even when you hear Christ speak earlier in the Gospels, um, if you think of the Beatitudes, all of these things that kind of change, he's he's sort of inviting us to see things as God does. They all seem, in a sense, unattainable, kind of like unrealistic. Like how like what are you talking about? How am I what you know kind of thing? But it's only in light of the resurrection. And in light of the grace that's offered in the resurrection, that these things become real. It's only through grace that we can that we can decrease so as to live in Christ, that Christ can increase in us. It's only by grace that we can set our minds on the things that are above and, and rise with Christ. It's only by grace that our side is healed, as Father Patrick mentioned from that from that reading, that that Christ's side is healed and heals us. It's it's only in light of the resurrection um, are we able to to recognize that this reality is really attainable and and that it's that it's on offer. Uh, it's not just some sort of like gnostic idea like that that it might seem at, at first blush. Boom! All right, we're rounding the clubhouse turn, as they say in horse racing, or maybe they don't say that in horse racing. I'm not sure. Um, what's up? I lived in Louisville for a year. I picked a lot of things up. <laughs> Uh, so we now have our, our gospel taken from John. We've had a lot of John during the course of Lent, and we get to enjoy more John during the Easter season, since John has the longest meditation on the resurrection. So if you read the gospel of Mark, depending on, well, there are four different endings of the gospel of Mark, depending on your manuscript tradition, which is a nerdy thing to say, but the gospel of Mark only has like eight verses dedicated to the eggs. Exactly. As it's only eight verses dedicated to that period in the church's life, and it ends with the words, for they were afraid. So you don't actually even see Jesus. You just see people running away from the empty tomb in terror. And then Matthew has a kind of uh, short meditation. It's only maybe 20 verses. So Jesus appears. He goes before him to Galilee. He ascends. He tells him to baptize all nations. 
Luke has more. Obviously, he's got the uh, the road to Emmaus, which is a which is a pretty thick account. But in the Gospel of John, you've got a lot to 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 ponder as concerns the resurrection. So Mary first goes, finds the empty tomb. She goes to the disciples. Peter and John run. They find the empty tomb. You know, John believes. Peter, you know, they go back to the upper room. And Mary comes back. She sees angels. She turns. She sees a gardener. He's Jesus. He says, "Don't hold on to me." And then eventually, Jesus starts appearing in the upper room without Thomas and then with Thomas. And then there's a whole another chapter where he's, you know, cooking breakfast, they're out fishing. And then it's, uh, there's like, there's like seven in the boat. This one my, they're on a me- making brunch. They're on, he's <laughs> making some omelets. They're on a men's yeah. corporate retreat. <laughs> exactly. Bottomless mimosas and bloodies. Just kidding. But seriously. Okay. So, um, and then it says that Peter leapt into the water. No, he clothed himself and leapt into the water. Uh, occurrence of, um, the Greek word gumnos, which I think means naked, but I've been told that Peter probably wasn't naked because they wouldn't do such things in Jewish culture. Just a nice little tidbit. And then they have the extended kind of conversation with a huge catch of fish. And then um, after that, you have these strange passages where like John's following Peter and he's like, what's with this guy? And he's like, don't worry about him. He'll be with me to the end of the age. So there's just wild stuff about the resurrection going on in the gospel of John. That's what I'm trying to say. So if you're like, hey, for Lexio during the for during Easter, I'd like to you know consider these post-resurrection appearances. John's a great place to start because it just gives you the fullest, the kind of most wild and mystical account. Father Jacob Burton is staring me down like a monster. I'm just listening. <laughs> I'm, just listening. <laughs> I'm just listening. I I'm from Connecticut. My face just looks like that. <laughs> I can't help it. So uh, so I'm gonna read the gospel. <laughs> a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed, for they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In John's gospel, there's this beautiful emphasis on not yet understanding in God's time. This happens, um, we, we, we just heard this on Holy Thursday, right, where uh, Jesus tell, tells Peter, you do, you do not understand what I'm doing. Um, Thomas asks, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, well, you, you know the way. Um, and yet it doesn't seem that there's kind of understanding. And then, then here again, for they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. Uh, there's still, you know, we're just hitting Easter, we're hitting this beautiful moment of glory, and there's still a kind of um, unfolding of things. There's a sense that, that, that all is not yet made manifest. Um, so even on Easter Sunday, we have, um, we have hints, foreshadowings, uh, gentle echoes of melodies to come, uh, that, that the Holy Spirit has not yet been sent. We're already hearing about the Feast of Pentecost on Easter Sunday, um, and the Lord is giving us a prelude of greater things to come. The this part of the gospel, when you know they're running to the tomb, um, I, I try to imagine like Mary Magdalene's fear, or like kind of like that that moment when like your stomach drops out, you know, and it's like, oh no, what's happened, you know. I was, I was trying to think of a good analogy for that or a good time, but it's kind of like, I would only, this is terrible. I only thought of like losing my keys. It's like, can't find them anywhere. You're like panicking, like, like for me to lose something, you know, but like this, like, you know, infinitely, infinitely greater. Like I'm just trying to imagine what that would have been like after suffering through the the Triduum, not the Triduum, but you know, the Good Friday and, and the silence of Holy Saturday and all of this. And then she gets there and it's like, he's just gone. Like, He's gone. Where, what happened? Um, and it's interesting how each of each of the people in the gospel, Mary Magdalene, Peter, John, and then later the disciples, as Father Gregory and Father Patrick mentioned, um, they all sort of have to have their sort of, uh, 
I mean this in the best sort of way, like their come to Jesus moment when it's not a sort of like moment of conversion from debauchery and sin in that sort of sense, but they, they come to our Lord in different ways or he perhaps he comes to them at different moments. So Mary meets him in the garden, the disciples meet him in the upper room, but each one comes to believe through encountering the risen Lord. Um, through that through that encounter. And I think if we look back at sort of the trajectory or the images, the allegory, the analogies that we've received throughout the Gospels um, of who Christ is, how he's used these stories, these parables to teach us about his love and mercy for us, all of them have him coming to us. He, he's the one that sits down with the woman at the well. He's the one who runs to the prodigal son. He's the good shepherd who goes out to find the lost sheep. And even in the resurrection, he's the one who comes to these people individually as their God who loves them. Uh, and I think the same for us. Even if we're trapped at home and can't go to church, these things, our Lord, we have to take uh, hope and stock in the fact that our Lord comes to us in his resurrection. And he comes to us not just to sort of show off like, hey, I won, you know, like I'm, I'm victorious, death, you lost. But because he wants to draw us into himself, as St. Paul in our in our second reading was was talking about, and as St. Peter recited for us in, in the first reading, um, Jesus, Jesus, in a sense, does the work. He does the work. He died. He rose and he comes. He comes to us to, to, to change our hearts and, and to draw us into his life. Um, as a final thought, <clears throat> I want to commend St. Mary Magdalene to you, the listener, as a kind of patron for this time. Why? Okay, well, let's think about it. Um, I want to do it through uh, a Dominican blessed, blessed Jean-Joseph Lataste. He founded the Dominican Sisters of Bethany, and he had a special love uh, for women in France who were in women's prisons specifically. So he felt a real draw to um, the implication of this is not that you are a women prisoner, by the way, listener. Um, so he had, a, he, had a, he had a big draw to preach to these women uh, for their conversion. So a lot of them would have been, you know, like prostitutes or some of them would have committed brutal crimes. These women's prisons were restricted to Tufts. Um, and he went and he preached a retreat on St. Mary Magdalene. And he did all night adoration and he sat in the confessional to hear confessions. Uh, and, you know, he, he didn't really see who was in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament because he was in the box. And he was hearing like a, a kind of steady stream of confessions by which he was encouraged. But then halfway through the night, he heard this rush of feet, which caused him great panic because he thought that, you know, they were just kind of going to fall upon him and tear him to pieces. But then he popped his head out of the confessional and he saw basically that the women, all the women in the prison had divided the night uh, into two watches. And so the first kept watch for the first few hours. And then the second half kept watch for the second two hours. And he was hearing the changing of the guard. So like he had encouraged them to do this effectively by virtue of, um, he was, he, he told them, he called them dear sisters and he told them that they were capable of conversion <clears throat> because St. Mary Magdalene was, uh, that the Lord loved them. And he proposed her to them as a model and as an intercessor. And they really took to that. And so it grew into this beautiful ministry. He founded uh, a congregation of religious sisters, some of whom actually had been, you know, have pasts, but wouldn't talk about it, but, but had pasts and then came to religion in that way. Some of whom didn't necessarily have a past, but it was a place where you could kind of follow the Lord Jesus after the manner of Mary Magdalene. And here, like, you just kind of, you think about where Mary Magdalene has been and where she's come. Sometimes traditional to think of, to associate her with Mary of Bethany, to associate her with the woman caught in adultery from whom was driven seven demons, right? And so there's a kind of mashup of imagery, but you think that she had lived a life of sin. She had come to encounter and to know the Lord. She had formed a deep relationship with him over the course of his public ministry, <clears throat> and now he's gone, like Father Jacob Bircher was saying. And the line that, that, that comes out um, just a few verses later, which is most heartrending, is they've taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him, she says to the gardener. And I think at this time, when a lot do not have access to mass, um, I think a lot of people feel that way. Those words resonate. Like, <clears throat> Many of us have had conversions, come to a deep appreciation of the Lord Jesus and of his sacraments, the graces that they mediate, and now we feel bereft of his presence, like they, they have taken our Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. But Mary Magdalene uh, experienced this only to experience uh, a kind of greater consolation in the resurrection, but then a transformation of that, like, of that relationship as the Lord ascends into heaven. And so our relationship with the Lord, uh, it, is, it assumes different shapes in different times and seasons, and yet he remains present. Um, and yet he continues to offer us his grace. He continues to offer us like growth in the life of virtue, mystical gifts, which make us more to be recollected and cultivate a spirit of prayer. <clears throat> and so it is possible. Uh, he does not give us something, you know, that we can't endure, but rather 
permits these things to befall so as to train our hearts in righteousness and ultimately lead us more and more to him. So with that, uh, Father Jacob Bertrand, Father Patrick, anybody have final thoughts, final Paschal commendation for the listener? I do. You might have spied uh, that we're now on YouTube. We joked about that a couple of times during the episode that you could see us look at people's faces. Um, so look at my if face, you not people's if my you, face. <laughs> if 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 you would like to see the faces that Father Jacob Bertrand makes as we record <laughs> our episodes, you can do you can do so now on the YouTubes. Um, so the tubes are open for tubing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. We're now on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check it out there. Um, I don't know if I have any, the only thing I was gonna gonna add to the 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 community and the story of those women in prison that Father Gregory mentioned. There's a wonderful novel about them um, by a woman named Rumor Godin. She wrote a couple novels on one on a women's Benedictine community and then one on this community from from the Bethany sisters. It's called Five for Sorrow, Ten for Joy. Off of the Rosary, Five Sorrowful Mysteries, Ten not sorrowful, you know, 10 glorious, joyful mysteries, but a really beautiful novel on, on these women and sort of the working of grace and, um, and uh, just the, the beauty, of, beauty of our Lord's love for us. So if you're looking for something to read during the Easter season, perhaps a novel by Rumor God and Five for Sorrow, 10 for Joy. I got one Thomistic Institute plug. The Thomistic Institute are running quarantine lectures, which are basically like your ordinary Thomistic Institute lectures, but done from the Dominican House of Studies. And we're live streaming them on YouTube, Facebook, and you can join up on a Zoom call if you want to ask a live question. So you can check that out. Uh, those are all also available on YouTube after the fact. And then um, in addition to that, we uh, just made our RCIA program free. So through the generosity and uh, kind of evangelical spirit, it's the folks at St. Benedict's Press, uh, Credo, which is a program that we did with them two years ago, is now 100% free. So all the videos are online and all of the materials, you can just send them in a, you just like put your, your information into a form on their website and then they'll just send you pdfs of the catechist book and of the student book because you know a lot of people's rcia plans are being disrupted and it's really hard to coordinate uh so they just wanted to make those available so that people don't uh yeah people don't fall out of the ark of salvation as it were so check those out quarantine lectures and credo and now to wrap things up father jacob bertrand is going to lead us in the prayer after communion in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen, amen. Look upon your church, O God, with unfailing love and favor, so that renewed by the Paschal mysteries, she may come to the glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thanks again for joining us on God's Planning. A blessed Easter to you and yours. We continue to remember you in prayers and in Mass. Uh, I will specifically offer up uh, my Easter Mass tomorrow. For you listeners, uh, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God strengthen you in these times. All right, bye-bye. Thanks for listening to God's Plan, a work of the Dominican Friars of the province of St. Joseph. Visit us at opeast.org.